who's been a Toastmaster, mm, not uh, George is right too, <laughs> who's been a member of Toastmasters for a number of years. But before George gives his speech, let's hear from Jerry Chapman as to what George's objectives are. Thank you, Mr. Toastmasters. George is speaking out of the Speaking to Inform manual. I believe this is his first speech, Speaking yes. to Inform. Mm -hmm. His objectives are to select new and useful information for presentation to the audience, to organize this information for easy understandability and retention, and to present the information in a way that will help motivate the audience to learn. His time would be five to seven minutes, but George took the discretionary choice of having it be a seven to ten minute speech. Yeah. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you. So a little bit about George. He's um, been a computer programmer for a number of years with Centene Corporation. But George says that the turning point in his life came in July of 2005 when he took the Landmark Forum. Tonight's speech is part of a project that he's doing or working on with the Landmark um, Education's Self-Expression and Leadership Program. The goal of that project is to end global warming by promoting a new cutting-edge technology, thorium and the molten salt reactor. So let's welcome George Cunningham and learn about that. Yeah, I know, I know. Th thank you, Jerry, for the help. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters. And you know, thank you, guests, for coming. I really appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be talking about global warming. How many people here are concerned about global warming? Just about everybody. That's great. So you know, this is going to be a different type of speech than you've probably heard in the past. Tonight, I'm going to be talking about alternatives or solutions to the global warming crisis. I'm going to be looking at alternatives such as solar warming or solar heating, uh, wind power, conservation, and in particular, thorium. Now how many people here have heard about thorium before, tonight? Yeah, Mike, because I've told you, right? <laughs> okay, and my intention for the evening is that, uh, that we contact Congress uh, and ask them to spend, say, a billion dollars over the next five years to develop this technology and to see, answer the question, will it work? And is it really something that we want to do? So the first thing I'm going to do is like talk about, well, what is thorium? Well, thorium is atomic element number 90. Uranium is atomic element number 92. And the way that a conventional nuclear reactor works is you mine uranium out of the ground, form into little pellets, you put it into to big rods, and then you put it into a nuclear power plant. When it gets close enough together, it forms a nuclear reaction, produces heat and energy, and it drives a turbine. Now, this is the, the real simple version. Ener energy is produced. Now, what's the disadvantage to a conventional <coughs> reactor? Well, how many people here remember Three Mile Island? Right. So a conventional reactor can melt down and you know, we have China syndrome and so forth. And even if that doesn't happen, you have plutonium waste, which is now like they're talking about building Yucca Mountain and trekking it all over the country. So that's like a big problem. Well, in a thorium reactor, it's clean. It produces hardly any nuclear waste like plutonium and, and like that. It's passively safe, which means it can't melt down. If you had an accident or somebody blew it up, you know, it wouldn't really be that big a deal. It's abundant, which means we have millions of, millions of years worth of thorium in the Earth's crust, and it's easily accessible and mineable. It's proliferation resistant. Well, you know, what does proliferation resistant mean? Well, proliferation resistant means that you can't take the output from it and build an atom bomb. Um, in a conventional reactor, one of the products, end products, is plutonium, which can be used. So it's like a, the advantage is if you want to ship it off to India or China, you know, they can't use it to make additional bombs. So that's cool. And it's very economical. 
we like to think that it's possibly cheaper than coal. What I say about thorium, it's what fusion wants to be. <laughs> okay, so that's a little bit about thorium. So let's talk about like what are the fuel sources that we're using today. Coal is 51%. Nuclear currently is 21%. Natural gas around 18. And renewables such as solar and wind are only 2%. And if you listen to environmentalists, they want to take this and make it much, much bigger. And I want to talk about that a little bit. One of the big ways that they're going to do that, or they propose doing that, is conservation. You know, there's one of the ways you can conserve energy is putting in a 60 watt bulb instead of a 75. But there's limits to how much you can do that. Because like one of the big sources of electric use is air conditioning. How many people here in this room use air conditioning in their homes? Wow, just about everybody. How many people would be willing to give up air conditioning to save the world from global warming? One, two, a, a few, a few, okay. Well, you can see that there's not, to, to really to solve this, you know, you're gonna have to give up 80% of your electric use in this country. And then, that doesn't include the people in India and China. Because India and China are bur you know, burning coal. So coal, natural gas, oil, all produce carbon dioxide, which are, contributes to global warming. So either we're going to have to have renewables really big or nuclear. And I'm going to say that it's not sufficient. Renewables alone aren't going to, oh, I didn't talk about renewables. Ooh, let's talk about that. So I get it. getting excited here. So uh, there's like two main sources of renewables. One is solar. and it has its place. Like in the Mojave Desert, you can create a solar plant that is you know, semi-economical. Makes sense to a degree. But even then, you have to have transmission wires to bring all the thing from the Mojave Desert to Los Angeles. And it's, it's very expensive. They're probably between 30 cents and a dollar per kilowatt hour. And coal is like five cents. Somebody's got to pay for that. Now wind, wind is a little bit, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's a possibility. It's five cents or so to produce the power, but then you have the transmission cost. That's about 10 cents. And the, the disadvantage of wind is that wind tends to blow when it tends to blow. And it doesn't tend to blow in the middle of the afternoon when people need their air conditioning. So, you know, if you could store it, if there was a way to cheaply store it, that would be a good thing, and then wind would be much more valuable. I think that if you look at solar power and wind power uh, and conservation, you're talking maybe 20 to 35 percent. You could expand this from 20, from 2 percent to maybe 20 or 35, but you can't get the whole pie. And even if you spent, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars on renewables, you know, what about the people in India and China? You know, they don't have the money to do that. You know, I'm going to quote Jim Hansen. How many people here have heard of Jim Hansen? Nobody. Okay, so he's the NASA scientist who's really been pushing this and the world's leading expert on global warming. This is what he has to say about it. It would be exceedingly dangerous to make the presumption today that we will soon have all renewable electric power. Also, it would be inappropriate to impose a similar presumption in China and India. Both countries project large increases in their energy needs both countries have highly polluted atmospheres, primarily due to excess of coal use. <coughs> so, renewables are insufficient to stop global warming. Let me say that again. Renewables are insufficient to stop global warming. What we need is a source of cheap and abundant energy that will satisfy not only our energy needs, but the, the energy needs of the entire world. And I say that thorium could be the answer. But what I'm asking for is about a billion dollars to, to, you know, to research it, to design the plants, create a pilot plant, and to, to really look at the question, can this be the answer to our energy needs? So uh, in conclusion, you know, that's what I'm asking for. 
And I'm also looking for someone or a group of people who are interested in this and passionate about this to work with me to contact my congressman and to really make a difference in this area. So, and I'm not going to ask for hands or anything like that. But I mean, if you're interested, you know, please see me after the meeting. I've got a couple more minutes left, so I'd like to take questions and answers before I leave the stage. Eric. How did you discover it? Excuse me? How did you discover it, Brian? Oh, uh, it was on the internet. I was, okay, that's a good question. Um, Al Gore had this big space shot speech. You know, we're talking about spending trillions and trillions of dollars. And I said, well, you know what? He's full of, you know, whatever. Um, you know, it can't be done. So I actually started looking at, you know, solar power, wind power, energy, uh, fusion power, and, you know, just like a long path, and I ended up here. It's like the only thing that really seemed like it could be the answer. Uh, uh, Mike. Uh, how did you come up with the billion dollar mark? Do you, you actually... Pulled it out of a hat. Okay. Pulled it out of a hat. Because by today's standards, it seems like it might be a little cheap when you consider the cost well, of a nuclear... For design work, and to build a small pilot plant. You could build it for, you know, the pilot plant could be built for a couple hundred million okay. if you had the design and the blueprint. We're still in the early stages. So it's not re really ready to go commercial. A commercial plant, a large scale one, might cost five, five billion. And if you really wanted to solve it, you'd probably have to have a couple hundred of them. So you're talking a trillion. But you'd want to prove it before you did that. Uh, Todd. Is this just for electricity, your, your chart up there? I noticed oils. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a way of producing electricity. Um, you can also use it, you know, hook it up to a desalinization plant to make uh, fresh water. Um, you know, if, you, if it really panned out, if, and, you know, if you're talking about 20, 30 years down the road, you could take carbon dioxide out of the air and mix it with hydrogen to produce a whole new fuel. Mike. How many physicists? actually started a thorium reaction? Has it been yes, done? we've had, there's been one built, uh, it was built in the, the late 60s, early 70s. Um, you know, back then the priorities of the nation was, were very different. Bombs were good, you know. I mean, like seriously, people were in a cold war with the Russians and, um, you know, so we had different priorities, different design criteria. And all of today's reactors were designed in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, so that's sort of the background of how we got to where we are today. All right. Is no one else using thorium? Oh, well, thorium is actually being used in a lot of different places. Um, you know, you can actually mix. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Uh, Madam Generally Bagger. <laughs> Whoever. Fellow Toastmasters. Especially you, George. George, we go way back. Mm -hmm. And you've been in Toastmasters as long as I have, I believe. And I believe this is your best speech that I've seen you do yet. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Yeah.